Okay, welcome, welcome to a spotlight on. I am joined by Dr. Caroline Foster and Dr. Sarah Fiddler, and we're going to be talking about HIV medicine, present and future. So before we start, could you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Um, so Caroline, would you like to go first? Thank you very much, Bakita. Um, so I'm Caroline Foster. I'm a doctor. I started off life as a paediatrician, so looking after small kids. And about 15 years ago, as you were all growing up and becoming teenagers, and then the cohort that went before you were becoming young adults, we set up a service called the 900 Clinic. And so now I look after young people living with HIV, with Sarah, and with a great team of nurses and psychologists. And the oldest young person who was born with HIV in our clinic is now 36. That's great. I didn't know that. Yes. That's a nice and, fun fact. I really and, like that. And lots of the young people, both the boys and the girls, have their own healthy children. Mm -hmm. We've had twins and all lots of fun. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline and Sarah. So I came to work with Caroline again 15 years ago. It's been the most exciting period of and treat to work in this clinic. Um, but my background was that I trained in um, HIV and infectious diseases a very long time ago because I'm very old, before there was even medicines for people living with HIV. And so I was right there when you know people were really very sick. And now things have completely changed and. We've seen people, you know, do extremely well on medicines and live a normal and healthy life. And um, the, the clinical work mostly that I do is in, in research. So a lot of the work I've done, as well as the clinic I do with Caroline, is doing tests for new types of treatments and looking at the um, science with people who work in a lab on how those new treatments might work and how that might end up one day hopefully curing people from HIV. Great, thank you, Sarah. So you were talking about treatments. Can you explain to us, thinking about the present and right now, what HIV medicine is and how it works for us and why people living with HIV need to take it? So HIV is a virus, which is a, a funny idea because we can't see it. It's a tiny weeny thing that you need to look under a microscope to see. And the way viruses work is that they live inside of our own body cells. So most of us who have a virus, you can't see anything um, when you look at that person, but inside their body, there's lots of activation going on where our body is trying to get rid of this virus. And HIV is adapted some very clever ways that it can stay hiding inside our body cells um, so that it allows it to live. So most people who live with HIV look fit and well on the outside and they can do everything they like doing, play football, do sports, see their friends. But this virus is, is going everywhere they go with them. And so how we want, what we want to do is try and stop that virus being um, in any way causing any damage to people's bodies. So that's how the pills work. So in the olden days, we didn't have medicines for HIV. So people didn't have any treatment to make them get better. And without treatment, long, over long periods of time, so over several years, the virus can cause damage to how our body fights infection. So those are our white fighter cells. You might have heard your doctors talk about them. And these cells eventually get damaged and then destroyed by the virus. So we have to try and stop that. And the way to stop that is to take pills that block the HIV virus. And we started with pills that really weren't very good, but they were better than nothing. And they had some side effects. If you used to have to take lots of medicines that really didn't taste very nice, and lots of tablets to swallow every day with food, without food, and it was really difficult. But right now, we have really very, very effective medicines. And people have to take them every single day, unfortunately. Otherwise, the virus has special ways of sneaking around those medicines to stop them working as effectively. But when you take those pills, it 
blocks any virus from being coming out of the cells. And so our immune cells, those white fighter cells, can keep working really well, really strongly, and people's health is pretty much normal. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Caroline, Sarah was talking about, you know, treatment, how it works now, and some things to think about and research for the future. Now, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about injectables and injectable medicine. Could you tell us about what that is and why it might be something that really helps young people living with HIV in particular? Great question, Bakita. So at the moment, most young people can just take one pill once a day. And that pill contains three drugs usually because we need to put HIV to sleep using three different drugs. Otherwise, the HIV will become resistant if we're just using one drug. Now, what people have been trying to do is make a long-acting injectable formulation. So that's a bit like the injectable form of contraception. So with contraception, you have one injection every three months if you don't want to take the daily contraceptive pill. And that's really good for people who forget pills or don't like pills. Now, some people living with HIV find taking pills every day, even if it's just one pill every day, really quite difficult. So there is an option which isn't licensed yet, but some people have got early access to it. That's what we call a compassionate use program, where they are having injectable anti-HIV medicines. At the moment, it's two injections into your bottom, one each side, every four weeks. And those medicines are called cabotegravir and rilpivirine. So it means you have to go to the clinic every four weeks for two quite large injections. They work very well to keep HIV to sleep, but they are quite painful and about two thirds of people get injection site reactions. Now, it's hoped that we'll be able to extend the interval, and there's some data suggesting that it still works if you have them every eight weeks. So the problem with injectables, particularly in the COVID era, when we don't want people coming to hospital very frequently, is one, you have to come to hospital every four weeks at the moment, and two, the potential for quite painful injection site reactions. But we have a couple of patients in the clinic who really much prefer it to taking oral medicines. And I think in the future, they will make preparations that last in the body much longer. So if you think of contraception, there's also something called the contraceptive implant, which goes in your arm and can last you know, for three to five years. And obviously, from a point of view of anti-HIV medicines, if we could have a long acting formulation um, that lasted for a year or more, that would really be a game changer. When I speak to young people about what would be the frequency that would make them switch from a daily oral tablet to an injectable, most people say to me they would want the injection to be three to six monthly at most to make it worth switching from an oral tablet to an injection. There is, at a recent conference, data presented on an injection that lasts for about six months. But remember, we always need, well, we used to say three medicines, but certainly with injectables, we need two different medicines to put the HIV asleep and to keep it asleep. Now, so at the moment, there's one injectable but it, that looks as though it lasts for six months, but it needs a friend okay to go with it but i think this is really exciting news lots of lots of you will prefer to swallow one pill once a day and what i would say is if you're on more than one pill once a day and you're aged 11 and 16 and attending camp go back to your team and ask them is there any way i can reduce the pills because unless you have resistance most people would be eligible for a one pill once daily regimen um, Going back to injectables, there is another way you might hear injectables being used, and that's using injectables as what we call PrEP. 
so pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that's to prevent people who are in a high risk of acquiring HIV, they can have an injection of one drug, capotegravir, um, every eight weeks. And that was actually better at preventing people getting HIV in high risk settings such as sub-Saharan Africa um, than taking an oral PrEP tablet of Truvada. So I think injectables are hugely hopeful for the future. I really hope we can get an implant as well that can last you know, a reasonably long time. One of the advantages of a solid implant that doesn't dissolve is that if you want to change, you can remove it. The problem with injectables at the moment every month is that if you decide you don't want to carry on or it doesn't suit you, they stay in the body for a very long time, sort of up to 12 months. And so you would then have to go back onto tablets because otherwise you'd have very low levels of the injectables and you would then get resistance in your HIV when it woke up to those drugs um, and drugs in that class. So it's not a small undertaking going on to injectables because you need to be aware that if you decide to come off them, you must be really good with your oral tablets for at least a year to prevent you getting resistance. And the problem with resistance is it influences your future treatment options. And if you have resistant HIV, it means you have to have more pills. But Thank it's all looking really bright for the future. Thank you. That's really interesting to know how that there are young people already who are using it and it might be rolled out soon to other young people. Um, I think especially with what you're saying about those young people who might find it a bit more of a difficulty to take their meds. I was definitely agreeing with you when you were talking about that window of three to six months, that would be the motivation to switch for me anyway. Not that either of you asked me, but it would be the motivation for me if it would last that long be like oh actually this sounds like it might be all right let's do that but yeah thank you so much Caroline that's like it's really good to know and it's really exciting to know um so speaking of development Sarah when you introduced yourself um you spoke about you do a lot of research as well as clinical care you spoke about developing um and researching developments for the cure now recently there has been news about a person in Sao Paulo um, and him being cured of HIV. Also over the past few years, um, I think two other people have, have been mentioned as well in different parts of the world. What does this mean for a cure generally that might be available for people living with HIV overall? Could you give us some insights into that and the work that you're doing? Thanks. That's a very complicated question to ask. Oh, so, I'll try. Sorry, I'll, I can break it up. No, it's fine. It's okay. fine. Um, so first of all, maybe I'll just start with what do we mean by curing HIV? So if we cure an infection, what we mean when, we, when we're doctors and we talk about that is that, that we can't find the bug anymore. It's completely gone from our body. And as I mentioned to you, what HIV does, which is what lots of viruses do, is they hide inside our body cells and they can stay there for however long those cells in our body live, which for some of our cells is for the whole of our life. So that's why when people are born with HIV or become infected with HIV, the cells of the body that have HIV hiding inside them will be there for the rest of their lives. And that's why at the moment we have to think of different ways of giving medicines that will keep those cells that have HIV hiding inside them quiet so that no virus pops out. So when we talk about the cure in HIV, what we're trying to say is, could you get rid of all those cells altogether so that even if you try and find even one of them, you can't find any? Now that's quite a big ask and it's also quite hard to, to answer that because we obviously can't look at every single cell in our body and even with amazing sort of technologies of special scanners and x-ray machines we can't tell which of our body cells have got HIV hiding inside them because they look normal on the outside. So the lab scientists have to do all sorts of clever experiments where they look at cells and see if they can find virus 
I don't know how they do that, but there's lots and lots of labs all over the world that are trying to look at that. And they've developed a whole load of different experiments that they can test how many cells in, for example, people's blood have got HIV hiding inside them. And for people like all of you guys who are on medicines for HIV, this is really rare. These cells are only like one in a million or maybe one in a 10 million. So you can imagine they have to take quite a lot of blood to find that one cell. And it's easy for them to make a mistake. So what we think might be a bit more realistic than getting rid of every single cell in the body that might have HIV hiding inside it is that we just try and make it so that these cells that have got HIV are quiet. No virus pops out of them. They may be there, but we're kind of going, okay, fine. If you're healthy and you're fine, your viral load test, so that's the test lots of you have done when you go to your clinic, where the doctors try and measure, is there any virus that we can pick up just going around all by itself in the blood? Those tests we keep undetectable. And so what people, scientists call this is they call it a remission. We're a bit scared to call it a cure because we think people aren't technically actually cured. So you then mentioned that there are two people in the world that we think have been cured of HIV. And by that, I mean that when they've done all sorts of special tests, they can't find virus. So those, those truly are cured. And they, they happen to be two old men who had HIV for many years, they were on medicines for a long time, and then they got some other medical condition wrong with them. So they got, both of them got a type of cancer of the blood cells. And for treatment of that, if you don't have treatment for cancer of blood cells, you actually die. So these guys had very little choice about what treatment they had, and they had really very intense treatment that they could have got very, very sick, even from the treatment itself. That's what people have when they have a type of cancer and it's called chemotherapy and it's called radiotherapy and it makes you feel really very poorly but what they did was that they used um, transplantation so they get rid of all of their own cells that might have the cancer in them and then they give them new cells from somebody else and the new cells they gave these two people from the uh, what's called a donor were free of HIV and so what happened is in both of those men that when they stopped their HIV medicines, no virus came back. And the first person who was called the Berlin patient, Timothy Brown, has been off his medicines for HIV for at least 12 years now. And he's not had virus come back. So we do think he's cured. The second patient was called the London patient, and he's been off treatment now for about two and a half years. And again, no virus has come back. And what's very exciting for the scientists is that we never thought this was possible. We never thought it would be at all possible to get rid of all the virus cells in the body. But it seems in those two people, it has been. Now, I keep saying this, the treatment they had was not something any of us would want to have if you don't have to have it. So it's not like you would go, oh, great, I'll have chemotherapy and radiotherapy because that'll get rid of my HIV because that treatment is very dangerous in itself. And some people don't make it through the treatment. But what it has shown us is it's possible. So you next asked me about this patient um, from Sao Paulo, which is in Brazil, who again looks like, and it's very early for him, he's been off medicine since March last year, that he may also have been cured of HIV. But again, these are early days, and I don't know if they've done all the extensive tests and laboratory tests on this Sao Paulo patient that they've managed to do on Timothy Brown. And when I say that, just to explain to you, Timothy Brown has had little pieces of his body taken out and looked at under a microscope. So they've taken out pieces of his gut. I think even his brain, he certainly had a test where they looked at the fluid around his brain to see if they can find any virus cells. So quite intense. Most of us, we do these tests using blood samples, which isn't very nice, but it's much easier to have than all these other tests. But the Sao Paulo patient was treated um, quite early on from when he first caught HIV. He went on to the medicines that you all take, nothing special. He was then added two more medicines for HIV. So he ended up taking five drug treatments. And if you remember, Caroline said, we want to give everybody at least two different chemical drugs against HIV. He ended up having five. And then he was also given a very high dose of a vitamin called nicotinamide, vitamin B. 
and then he stopped his medicine. So he's been off medicine since March last year, and they can't find any virus from many of the tests they've taken. But just to put it into context, there were five other people who were also doing exactly the same trial as him. So they also had the nicotinamide medicine and the extra two more drugs on top of their original three. And in all those other five patients, virus came back. So there's probably something very unusual about this particular patient, but we don't know quite what it is, whether the vitamin D worked or not. Should you all take vitamin D? I mean, there's no harm in taking lots of vitamins, but we certainly don't know from that one trial that that's the, the cure treatment. But the thing that's really interesting is there are whole new ways of treating HIV, HIV that we didn't really know about before. We know that you definitely need to take your pills that you're all taking now. But these are treatments that might be on top of that that could really help either get rid of, flush out, if you like, those cells that still have virus in them that are hiding away. And um, when the COVID problem is over, we're hoping to start looking in our clinic as well for new treatments in addition to the HIV medicines that might help just contain virus without you having to take medicines. So one option is what Caroline's just talked to you about, where we inject the form of the medicines you're taking as tablets at the moment. But these are different types of medicines that might also work as well. Thank you, Sarah. That's really useful to know because, you know, sometimes in the media, there can just be phrases that are said about cure without proper, um, without the proper background in terms of what that means. And especially what you were saying in terms of what people have had to go through to be able to be in that position as well. And I think many of us wouldn't have to have such intense medical mm -hmm. interventions as you described. So it's really good to get a, a fuller picture of what that means and the context that you've given as well. So thank you. Um, I have a last couple of questions. First off, is, is there anything else that maybe you would want to add that I haven't asked you that you think is maybe important to share when it comes to HIV medicine, past and future, but present and future and past if you want? I, I think, one really important message is that one pill once a day can really change your life in many ways. That if your virus is suppressed, you will remain healthy. Your immune system will be excellent, but also it will help you in your future, um, particularly around relationships. So, if you've been on meds for six months and you're undetectable, there's the statement that you may all have heard on of U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. That means that you can't transmit HIV. If you're on your medicines, you don't miss any pills, you have your regular clinic blood tests, you can't transmit HIV to your partners in the future. And that's really, really important. And for me, over the last 15 years, that has been the biggest game changer for young people living with HIV in that they know as long as they keep taking their pills, they can't transmit HIV. They can have normal relationships. It makes disclosure in relationships much easier. It also means that in the future, if you're a young woman living with HIV and you want to have children, you won't transmit HIV to your children around the time of delivery. Um, and if you're a young man living with HIV and you're on your medicines and suppressed, you can conceive kids, you know, get your girlfriend pregnant in absolutely the normal way. And in the past, that wasn't the advice we give. So medicine is fantastic for maintaining your own health but in the future for making relationships and having families so much easier thank you very much and we actually have a spotlight talking about um talking to other people about hiv especially partners so we're going to be discussing you equals you a lot but that the fact that medicine has evolved so much to one pill a day being possible and then what that means 
in terms of being healthy and not passing on HIV is amazing. So I think I want to just say a, rem a reminder of what Caroline said of if you are taking more than one pill a day at the moment, see if you can talk to your doctor about what options there might be for you. Thank you. And Sarah, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I just wanted to add to Caroline and um, statement about the, the medicines because they really do work and I think there's lots of things that seem frightening about living with HIV and especially if you're um, younger and you've just found out that you're living with HIV you know we we expect everybody to have a very good healthy future you know travel the world do whatever you want to do the difficulty is you have to at the moment anyway fit in taking medicines every day around doing that but these medicines work and if the medicines you happen to be taking have side effects that make you feel a bit sick or you have a headache or they don't make you feel great again talk to your doctor about finding pills that work best for you because there's lots of different choices for us and you know if one pill works for your friend but it's not quite right for you then then talk about trying to find something that works for you um, but we don't expect to see people getting very sick living with HIV and growing up with HIV anymore because we have these medicines. Thank you, an important reminder, thank you. Um, so my final question, so the theme of camp this year is superheroes. So I wanted to ask you who is a hero to you and why? Um, I think I'd have to say all the, so I've been working in HIV, I'm nearly as old as Sarah, we're both two old ladies, but I have had the privilege, my superheroes are the kids that I met when they were babies 20, 25 years ago, and are now young adults, healthy, getting on with their lives, living really for fulfilled lives. It's an absolute privilege for us. But really, those guys are my superheroes. Thank now you. Put me on the spot because I've got to think of something different. You can <laughs> say the same thing. That's I fine. I've learned from all the years that we have been working with people living with HIV, people growing up with HIV, but also, you know, your mums, your dads. I, I feel it has been the most extraordinary and and experience and a real privilege and you know stories that we can tell you about you know days when a patient of mine said oh princess diana who's now died and you've probably never even heard of her <laughs> but he was going to come and visit them and i thought yeah really and she did and you know we've had the most extraordinary journey that has been driven by really incredibly courageous brave people who have come out talked about hiv pushed for equality, pushed for all sorts of agendas, as well as medicines, um, in a way that no other condition has ever done. So I think, you know, a real credit to all of you. It's been so brave that you've gone to this Cheever camp. You know, most young people wouldn't do that. And you're amazing and your future is great and we'll do our very best to keep you well, but the work is yours and thank you for inviting us. Thank you both. That's a beautiful way to wrap up. Thank you for your time and for everything that you do. So I know I'm saying on behalf of everyone who's going to be watching and the Chiva family as a whole, thank you for all of the support that you give us, um, the care that you give as doctors and beyond as well. Um, and we appreciate you a lot. You're big, big friends of Chiva. Thank you, Bazooka. You're welcome. Thanks.